Hello, I'm Anne Flaherty. This interview is the second of a three-part literature and music series of interviews for the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, London. For the past 25 years, the centre has delivered the most diverse Irish cultural and educational programme outside Ireland. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Hayes. Martin is one of Ireland's foremost musicians and his fiddle playing has won international awards. He has performed in such prestigious venues as Carnegie Hall, the Sydney Opera House, the Albert Hall. He has played for President Obama and the White House. He has played with Paul Simon and Yo-Yo Ma. And he's a great friend to the Irish Centre in Hammersmith. His new memoir, Shared Notes, which is published by Penguin, has been described as personal, poignant and immensely profound. Martin, welcome to this interview today. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for having me. I'd first like to ask you how the book came into being. Um, I wondered if it was something that you had been thinking about for a long time, uh, a way maybe you had time for reflection uh, over lockdown when you were in touring. And how easy did you find the process of delving into your life and putting the jigsaw puzzle together? Well, it's it's an interesting uh, question, Anne, because, um, you know, I, I imagine that, like, you know, many, many people probably think about writing a book in, in a vague sense, or imagine if they did write a book, what would it be, or, or could you write a book, anything, we, we might have all those kind of thoughts, and I think that I would have existed in that same realm as everybody, uh, had it not been for the fact that I was approached by a publisher, and uh, and had it not been for the fact that I agreed and ultimately signed a contract and created a deadline. And uh, like, so, so a deadline was in fact the main impetus here. The, de the deadline was the, was the thing that caused me to, to write the book. And I, I, I um, initially, once I overcame the immense procrastination, you know, and, uh, and, and like the, the attempting to think the book out ahead of time, you know, like as if I would know what I was going to write and, and plan it. And, uh, you know, which I couldn't actually do. So in the end, when the time pressure got to such and such a point and I could calculate how many words I would need to write every day in order to meet the deadline, I simply decided to write. And I gave up trying to be smart and clever. And I gave up trying to come across in any particular way. And I just, I, I just said, OK, I'm just going to write as I speak, as I am. And... Uh, and once I got past that point of not being concerned about, um, you know, how it might be perceived or anything like that, I began to enjoy the process of writing, I have to say. So, so that was my experience. I mean, I always like to talk about music and I've always felt that there was something in the background that the music that I grew up with, with the older musicians and the music of Claire, uh, like I think, always felt there was some story there that wasn't properly aired or properly understood. So I, I always wanted to bring that to the fore in, in any way I could. And, uh, you know, I thought I might write a book about music, but I couldn't actually figure out how to write it. So a memoir ended up being the, the only option I had, like, you know, or the only way in which I could conceivably express all of this, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more, I suppose, than just a memoir. It's a musical journey. It's a personal journey. And it's also, also a kind of a social history, because I very much enjoyed reading the descriptions of you growing up there in East Clare and uh, on, on, on the side of the mountain there in Mahara and life on the farm and that lovely har harmony between the life on the farm, the changing seasons and, and, the, and the, the music that was being played then in the kitchen at night. Was it difficult for you to, when you started writing, to access those memories? Because it's a long time. Uh, no, it wasn't at all, because those memories are so etched in my, like they've, they've made such an impression on me. And even from, you know, later on in my teenage years and, and, and later on, I realized that I had seen the closing of a chapter kind of socially, uh, you know, as we entered the European, the EC at the time, I suppose. And as uh, modernity kind of suddenly crept its way right into my locality. And 
and we we went from being a small mixed farm with a few cows to to being a dairy farm we went from working with horses to working with a tractor and i was acutely aware that my sisters uh, who were born eight and nine ten years later had missed the entire thing that this entire reality of of this older life was gone within that period so i committed to memory almost like I felt like about the music later on as a teenager, I began to commit to not forget what this all was, you know? So I, so that was, that seemed that that was perhaps even the easiest part of the book to remember was all of that, you know? Well, there's very vivid descriptions, beautiful lyrical descriptions. I felt that uh, in, in the introduction when you talked about walking down the field with your father and he has the bart of hay, on his back in, and then the wisps come out and you gathered the wisps and you put them on your back. It was almost, it was like something out of a Seamus Healy poem. And then walking to school over the mountains every day and even describing the cobwebs and, you know, the, 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 the puddles and walking in the streams and the whole community that lived alongside the road uh, yeah. that you encountered. Uh, uh, it was very, um, it was very moving and, and very evocative, I suppose, of, of a time long gone. but. Uh, coming into your the start of your own musical journey, then um, you're watching your father PJ every night, and he plays in the Tullochelly band, and you want to be like him. Um, so you're watching him playing and, and listening to the musicians coming into the kitchen, and then when you're seven, you get your first fiddle from Santa, and there's a lovely moment where you describe. Uh, picking it up and assuming that because you've watched how it's done, you'll instantly know how to play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't think I. Well, I didn't have any concept of what was really involved in in, in learning how to play. Um, uh, so, so I, I just, you know, I mean, it wasn't just my father. Like, I mean, my 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 uncle Joe McNamara, he he played the accordion. My uh, another uncle married to my mother's sister Willie Conroy, he played the flute. My 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 uncle Paddy Kenny was like a great great fiddle player, and like so, there were lots and lots and lots of musicians around there. So enough for me to think, hey. This seems like a fairly normal, easy thing to do, you know. So you just get your fiddle and start at it or something, you know. But uh, it wasn't quite that easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, your father becomes your first teacher. He's your mentor. He's your advisor. He's your first critic. And uh, you um, take your, your first notes under his uh, tutelage. But um, as, as you begin to master uh, the instrument, um, you start to uh, notice uh, stylistically uh, differences between musicians. Um, I'm thinking in particular here of uh, what how you describe your your own father's style. In those days, of course, people were playing a lot for for dancing, for house dances, mm -hmm. and you describe describe his style as a very kind of a rhythmic style. He liked to play for for dancing, mm -hmm. but then Paddy Canny, who again was a great influence on you, had a very uh, lyrical style, a kind of a sweep that was very lyrical. And I wondered if you would mind explaining the differences between them, because your ambition at the time, I think, was to fuse the two into your own expression. Yeah, in fact, like, you know, they had made a record in, in 1959. I think it might have come out in 1960 or something like that. And uh, and it, it was a good record. And, and one, one side of the album was just two fiddles with the piano accompaniment. And and I, I and the other side had Peter O'Loughlin uh, from Kilmele playing the flute with them. But I, I loved that album. But I was also aware that the, what made up that album was two different stylistic um, approaches that were complementary to each other. One is like sweeping, lyrical, dynamic kind of playing, like from Paddy Kenny, and the other was like pulse rhythm playing driven by my father, who, who liked to play for the house dancers. And there was kind of a, a, a division between the musicians, between what we would call dancing music and energetic dance music and reflective and sensitive and subtle nuanced listening music uh, that you played in different circumstances or at different times. And some musicians were drawn more deeply into one of those areas than others. And uh, I, I, my experience had later as a teenager had drawn me into both of these things, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I felt I needed to resolve the conflict, you know? 
So I, I set about kind of trying to merge these seemingly opposed stylistic ideas into one idea in a sense, you know, so it's, it's my first kind of musical quest was to was to kind of bring some resolution to that and not be forced to make the choice between my uncle Paddy Kenny and my father, you know. So I, I, I could give you an example like of uh, like a tune uh, uh, maybe rolling in the barrel that how my father might have played it like. In that kind of rhythm and that kind of, but then, Paddy, oh yeah, and then then Paddy Canny would have been the. today like how would I play that then really I kind of keep alternating in a way It's a, it's a it's a small detail, but it, it, it's a it it continues, I suppose, to this day as being part of how I play, and it's a kind of an imprint that started like in my very early childhood, you know. That was beautiful. Thanks very much, Martin. So as you continue uh, to learn uh, music, you become part of the Tullochady band from a very young age. You're playing with a lot of older men, your father's generation, and they are very uh, generous and accepting of you, aren't they? You go along with them and you play all over the place um, and you're learning uh, as you go. Um, I, there were some very uh, funny uh, descriptions there of your time, and you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's come being wedged in the back of the of the car on your way home from playing uh, with the big bass yes, uh, yes. drum beside you, and then your father is saying, "Right, it's time now for everybody in the car to say the rosary." Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's like good old Catholic Ireland. You know, I often say I I, I met some. Um, some uh, Muslim friends um, from, from Iraq uh, some years ago, and they were talking about, oh, well, like how difficult it is there, how much religious repression there is and, and how much you have to follow the rules and stuff. I said, I said, you just don't realize like how, how religiously kind of conservative Ireland was uh, not so very long ago, you know, and, uh, and how much, you know, public prayer and like people blessing themselves, passing churches, genuflecting, um, saying rosaries, every house of the locality were on their knees every evening saying the rosary, never mind mass. Like, I mean, the rosary is gone a long time, probably from, from the mass consciousness. But, but, uh, but this was gone at a time when, like, missing mass was utterly out of the question. But miss, so was missing the rosary. And uh, so it was a, a Catholic conservative time, you know, and uh, it was just taken for granted, you know. Now, I think the younger people were... I was feeling resistance to it, but nevertheless, we went along with it. Like it was unconscionable not to, you know. There wasn't much you could do when you were held captive in the car going along the, the road anyway. But there was also the other ritual, I think, when you were out on the road with, with the band, which was uh, having the cup of tea. So it wouldn't matter if it was two or three in the morning, you'd get out of the car and the flask would come out and the digestive biscuits and you'd have tea at the side of the road. Yeah, now that is a strange habit, uh, to say the least of it, you know, a kind of a, a, a late night picnic, uh, I suppose. The, 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 the reason for getting out of the car was that Matty Ryan, who was driving the car at the time, uh, was an accordionist from Fika, but he was also a mechanic and he kept his car spotless. So he couldn't handle the idea like a four of us in there, like chewing down on kind of uh, digestive biscuits, you know, and having cups of tea in his car he knew was going to make a mess 
so 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 he so we had to get out of the car and jack of course uh, was a very old lovely gentleman from broadford county clare he brought along like a, a a tablecloth to put on top of the hood of the car so we would like stand around the car you know maybe the engine would be running the lights would be on but we're just standing there you know on the side of the road i, I remember like vividly just outside the town of adair one night like the four of us just there and all the cars passing by as we just standing, chatting, drinking tea at two o'clock in the morning, you know. I think we'd been playing in Newcastle West or somewhere, I can't remember, but anyway, it was, uh, those are some of the unusual experiences and memories, yeah. Well, you had very good times uh, playing with, with the, the Taliban and uh, then, um, it, time moved along. You mentioned there earlier how things were changing because uh, one of the first um, uh, pages of the book is the description of you as a small fella in Milton Mulvey watching your father and you look up to the sky at the moon and it is the very night that men were landing on the moon. And, you know, I, you know you're making the point, I suppose, that things were about to change. Things were changing in Ireland and, and they did change and the, the show band era came in and the Cayley music uh, faded a little bit in, in popularity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, even in terms of Irish folk music, there was um, huge uh, innovation in terms of looking to Eastern Europe and the you know, arrival of mandolins and blending innovation with tradition it was all very difficult but you uh, yourself were uh, in the in the traditional Cayley mold and you weren't um, uh, part of 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 either one or the other so that was kind of an, a little bit isolating for you as a teenager yeah it was yeah it, it, it was because like the 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 Cayley band reality of the, of that of that time was was the reality of, of an older generation and um uh, and a passing generation, I suppose, you know, and uh, and there was a new emerging kind of folk consciousness related to, I suppose, to the to the countercultural revolutions in in the U.S. and America and various other places, and and folk revivals in England and America, and you know, all of that that had happened through the '60s essentially was beginning to blossom in the '70s in Ireland, and uh, so I was, you know, I wasn't part of that, uh, and there was a kind of a a kind of a social and intellectual underpinning to all of it that, uh, you know, uh, somehow be, I'm somewhere on the side of a mountain or saying a rosary somewhere in the car, you know, like I'm a long way from this, you know, and, and yet I knew there was something in there that I wanted to be a part of and I just didn't know how to be, or I, you know, you're just not connected to it and you, you don't have the access really, you know. Mm. Well, as you w went uh, through your teens, then you started to take uh, to participate in uh, co um, in competitions, mm -hmm. uh, and at a competitive level, you started to win awards, all Ireland's and all sorts. So um, your identity then was kind of cemented as as, as a musician of talent. Mm -hmm. But then on the personal side, um, you still had no idea as you came to the close of your secondary schooling what you were going to do with your life and it didn't seem at that point that music was an option as a career am I right? No I mean like it, it, there was like I never ever now once in my entire life had I received any suggestion that I should pursue music as a career I, it was considered like ludicrous uh, really when it came to this music and there wasn't any real example of people being successful doing that so I didn't look it just, it was so implausible as that I never even gave it a thought myself. I mean, I might have thought the idea was lovely, but I never gave it any serious thought, you know, that, that it just didn't seem possible or likely in any known way that this could happen. So, so I, you know, I, I like to tell people I failed my way into being a professional musician, you know, like it was like as if I managed to fail at everything else and suddenly just end up playing this, you know. Like, you know, you, you literally had to take all other choices off the table. <laughs> then I played music for a living, you know. Yeah. Well, it was at Sam Beckett who said fail again and fail better. Yeah. Oh, well, I was, I was an expert failer, you know. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you had a few disastrous business ventures. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about them, but at one point, I think you were trying to, to uh, set up a froze, frozen dinner a frozen TV dinner franchise. Yeah, well, it, it, it kind of turned into a frozen food kind of thing, all right, you know, and it was, 
you know, it was just a, a harmless kind of little step into that arena. But um, I'm 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 really glad that that didn't work out. You know, uh, as it turns out, uh, I, I didn't realize it at the time. But uh, yeah, it was it was back in the eighties too when. Um, I had actually flunked out of college, like, which was kind of like a really, really stupid thing to do, you know, and um, just like I- irresponsible, you know, on my part. And um, and, and then I, I kind of went down the entrepreneurial route because there literally were no jobs, you know, and um, in, in the early 80s in Ireland was a pretty disastrous economy. So, yeah, I was I was floundering for a number of years and I, I floundered my way into uh, ending up in the United States, uh, ultimately for at least for the beginning year, um, on a construction site, and then later playing in kind of Irish bars in Chicago and places like that, you know. So, so the first 10 years of my life, like kind of blowing my educational possibilities, you know, starting businesses and acquiring debt and going broke and immigrating and not having immigration status sorted out, you know, I didn't have my papers in order. So I found myself kind of like, you know, just descending the steps like lower and lower, you know, to kind of like being less successful in in almost every area of life. And uh, I kind of at a certain point then I was I was beginning to drink a lot and uh, so there was alcohol involved there was a lot of things that were kind of holding me kind of you know just helping me giving me a helping hand to descend further you know and I, I like eventually got to the point where I, I knew that I really really between one thing including breaking my fiddle on St. Patrick's Day over somebody's head and all of this crazy stuff that went on I, I just at, at some point had to finally and for the first time in my life really wake up and uh, really kind of just take stock of who I was what I was what I didn't want to do what I could do what I was capable of and what and what meaning I could derive from life and how meaningful I could make it and find it you know so that that at that stage, I'm in Chicago. It's 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 the mid '80s, moving into the late '80s when I kind of start to kind of you know become a, a decent, normal human being. You know. <laughs> well, you mentioned there about finding music, or finding meaning in life, and really, I think am I right in saying a lot of that was about the music because um, the music that you were playing, um, which was for crowds and pubs, um, was it was. It was demoralizing for you, let's say, to come from a place where your talent had been valued and you had an identity as a musician to then be be, be playing for people who weren't maybe appreciative. And, and you felt uh, this wasn't, you know, authentic for you. You felt you, you wanted something better, but you didn't know how to achieve it. Exactly, yeah, that, that was actually very painful really like of all the experiences it, it's the it's the feeling like that um you know I, I think the closest i could get to it like would be the movie planet of the apes or something like that it's it's feeling like oh hold on a second here i have something of value here even if nobody can seemingly see it like you know and yet feeling deeply that i had something worthwhile you know in 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 what i could do musically and in what i felt and what i understood but could find almost no opening for it or no possibility of connecting to anybody or finding any circumstance where i could uh, open that door i mean the, the problem i mean i'm sure every artist really encounters it at some point you know is that uh, you have what it takes to do the thing but since you're not already doing the thing the people in that arena don't open the door for you because well they don't need to and first of all like they don't know whether you can or you can't do these things so they're not in there they you know you know like everybody wants you once you succeed like but until you succeed like nobody wants to open the door kind of you know so you you really have to uh be very patient with that i suppose you know suppose maybe you know the night that you did smash that fiddle uh, um, was a kind of a, an epiphany in a way because it was well first of all a metaphor I suppose of your own the piece your own shattered life but as they say you know the light comes in through the broken places and yeah. you did uh, then decide as you said to pick yourself up and the second 
part of your time in Chicago seems to have um, been a very uh, creative time because you then discover so many other musical influences in that city, yeah. uh, jazz and fusion and classical and all sorts. And you're coming into contact then with a very different type of, mm-hmm. of uh, m- musical um, community. Um, and I'm thinking here now, particularly, I suppose, of, of Dennis, of Dennis Cahill, because it was there that you met Dennis and which and that became a, a, a musical collaboration and on a and, a and a personal friendship that went on for many, many years. You toured all over together. Can you talk to me a bit about that? You were very different personalities. He was the more rational one and you were the more emotional one. And yet on stage. Yeah. He kind of had a symbiosis. Yeah. Well, you see, it, it reminds me a little bit, thinking back to my father and my uncle Paddy Canny, with like two different stylistic approaches that are end up being complementary to each other. And uh, with Dennis and myself, it was kind of like two kind of worldviews that are, are kind of like somewhat complementary. There's a kind of a very grounded, practical, rational you know, approach that Dennis seemed to have. And then there was this kind of wistful and kind of like passionate uh, engagement that I want to have you know and uh, and I I'm not grounded in any musical theoretical knowledge but but much more in in the emotional understanding of the music and connection to it and Dennis you know has studied music and he's quite au fait with with all of the musical theory that one would use in order to structure chords and rhythmic patterns and whatnot and uh, so the two of us were, were complementary to each other in a way, you know, as people and as musicians. And uh, so you, you think you want to find somebody just like you to, to play with. Like, but in fact, you're, you, you're, you're often maybe better off, you know, working with somebody who carries all of the things you don't carry, you know. And, uh, you know, it's a complementary opposition in a way, you know. It's a bit like a marriage, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it feels like, you know, when you're working as a duet together, you know, for those many years, you know, um, it's like, a, it's a very, very close friendship. And it's a very, you know, I mean, like, certainly on a musical level, and an emotional level, a very intimate kind of relationship and friendship, you know, that, uh, you know, that, like, men don't normally engage in i suppose you know uh, easily as, as, as we'd like to think but but it, it it required a good degree of trust and communication between the two of us that's for sure um at that time i think martin uh, uh, you were thinking about your own form of self-expression and and what you wanted to to bring to the music um and am i right in thinking that it was around that time you went to see rory gallagher play uh and yeah. you were so uh, you were so um, impressed, I suppose is the word, or by or his uh, emotional involvement in his performance. Yeah. It was such a, a a giving experience that you, you you said to yourself, "That's the way I want to be as a musician." Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't even about his music so much. You know, it's not like uh, like like the Rory Gallagher is the be all and end all of all musical taste for me. In fact, I I rarely enough listen to it. But uh, but that wasn't the point. The point was that I saw his performance, and I saw the way in which he opened up personally, and the way in which he uh, gave of himself musically. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, that if you really, really want to make a genuine connection as a human being on the stage with others, um, I felt, you know, there it is. That's how, that's what it is. Uh, as, as Rory Gallagher did it that night in Chicago, that's how it needs to be done. Now you don't need to play rhythm and blues. You can be playing anything really. But but that level of openness and that level of uh, vulnerability, I suppose, uh, I felt were were important aspects. You know, you you really gotta like if you're doing this, you you I suppose you do have to stand up and be counted. You know, you actually have to like stand firmly on your in your belief and in your faith and confidence in this music and trust. You know, the audience trust yourself and uh, and just let go with it. You know. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of something that your father said to you, I think, when you would play a tune, a tune for him and he, he would, or any piece of music, he would say either it had tradition or it didn't have tradition. It had tradition or it had no tradition. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and what he 
what he meant was it either had soul or it didn't have soul. Correct, yeah. That was it, yeah. Yeah, he, he, I mean, he wasn't one for flowery language or for, or for any kind of clever metaphor in expressing what he thought or felt. But uh, knowing him well enough, I knew exactly what he meant when he said something did have tradition or didn't, you know. And for him, it, it really was like, like, would, would it bring a tear to his eye? Would it, would it make him like feel something deep and, and emotional and meaningful for, for you know, would it, would it bring that experience? Because for him, the tradition was simply defined by that uh, as to whether the music was capable of awakening that reality within you. And so the tradition for me and for him and for a lot of these people was a lot more ambiguous and a, a lot less difficult or much more difficult to kind of pin down in any technical or analytical way or any intellectual way uh, because like essence of music like the duende of music in Spain or you know or the blues in in America you know are feeling expressions that go beyond what we can intellectually describe but but nonetheless are crucial and must be felt and understood on some deeper level you know and that is in a way for me what is definitive of the tradition you know that that's one of the key beautiful elements of this music that I, I find is you know essential you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a connection too, isn't there, between the, the musician and the audience as well. There has to be that, that connection that, uh, that they're feeling it too. Yeah. How do you, how do you, can you, when you go out on a, on a stage, can you read the audience, shall we say? Uh, when I walk out on the stage, I can't read anything really. I, I, I the, you know, I, I can look out and see people, but I, I don't know anything. So it's up to the musician to take the first step vulnerability and into openness and into like a genuine willingness to to communicate and to reveal you know and it is only after that uh, do you get a sense that uh, that there's a connection and an understanding and so uh, so for me it's important to uh you know have faith in the audience and have trust in them and not to underestimate them in any way you know and to just be open, like, I mean, I've always felt that the better of any genre of music is the music that uh, doesn't require explanation. And it doesn't require like a, a, a deep insider's knowledge, you know, I mean, like there is something to be gained from a deep insider's knowledge for sure. You can certainly find other levels of enjoyment and experience and other areas of appreciation. But but the, the better forms of music I've always felt are like are able to speak out, out of their genre and connect right across to anybody. And I've always felt that there was a, an important and necessary universality in, in traditional Irish music and that that universality was something that I needed to access. I needed to trust. I needed to see if, if like things that I experienced at a deep emotional level as a fifteen-year-old somewhere around Glandary or Fakel actually could have resonance, you know, in, in in Kyoto when I'm playing in a temple. It turns out that my experience of it seems to suggest that yes, things are far more universal than we might have previously imagined. In making the Irish traditional music universal did you at any point feel that you were uh well i won't say betraying but certainly straying yeah. from yeah. the or your origins deep in the heart of traditional you know east Clare? yeah of course yeah no well and that's a very important question and a good question because like one of the underlying assumptions that i i had heard so often was that like in order to appeal one would have to water down break down compromise uh, in some way in order to connect now clearly that was going to be a problem for me uh, so i i you know it's a bit like saying like eula says because it was spoken in dublin like as it were you know like can't actually be universal well it turns out it is you know universal like and and the colloquial and the and the and the and the you know the the vernacular of 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 of, of localities have now begun to become universals whereas like uh, in times previously that would not have been imagined possible uh, so i chose instead 
to go digging deep into it and to start looking for essential qualities, you know, and to, to understand that the central part of traditional music is the melody. And, and that melody is in its essence a universality. And that in the universality of that melody is the possibility of creating a universal musical expression. So for me, it was not so much watering down, but as, as going deeper into the essence and at the same time, making every conceivable effort to clarify and unclutter so that the essential essence of it might, might be understood in some way. You know? that, that lead, you know, I'm not by any means claiming that I have achieved that. Uh, I, I have moments when I think I do, uh, but it is the goal and uh, it is the, the thing that drives me, you know? I was wondering whether there was ever any discussion or debate between you, say, and your, and your father about your, your um, innovative approach and, and your different approach, how they viewed it. Did he like it or did he ever express any opinion? No, he, 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 seemed, to, he seemed to like it. And, um, uh, and I think there were parts of things I did here and there and some things I didn't choose that he wouldn't necessarily approve of. But on the other hand, he also, even if he didn't quite understand what I was trying to do or approve of it, he at least knew that I was genuine and that I knew what the real thing was and that I was at least being, uh, I was aware and, and I was also operating with some level of integrity. He did that on, on a personal level. So, so he didn't question my, my efforts that way, which was like a big help, I think, you know, it was quite nice, you know, and he was also, I think, happy to see me, you know, to whatever degree I did anyway, to actually succeed, I suppose, in, in managing to have that career. Yes, absolutely. And just going back there to Chicago, after you change your style and, and you're collaborating uh, with Dennis and you're touring, etc., you then move towards uh, the West Coast. So you are over down the Seattle way and you're meeting people from Portland and it's a very different vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and then what, what I'm, I suppose what I'm leading to is that you, you come back there, you're living in Connecticut, but there's a, a sense of maybe a dislocation from what's happening in the heart of, of New York and where there are a lot of musicians that you want to connect with. And what I'm leading up to there is your, um, your relationship then with, with Thomas Bartlett, how that came about and ultimately the founding of the gloaming, which became a global phenomenon. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, like I kind of, um, you know, I mean, Seattle, I suppose, is like the, the northwest of America and uh, not that many people from other places go there, although it is an astonishingly beautiful city and a lovely place to live. And I did enjoy my years. And then I ended up um, all through relationships and whatnot. I ended up um, uh, living in Connecticut for, for a number of years. And that, that was, um, that was, I suppose, where I was kind of in a more of a suburban kind of uh, reality and, um, like I, I was beginning to feel like the world was passing by a little bit, you know, and like I could easily see how like, you know, you could spend the next X number of years simply walking the dog around the suburban locality and uh, and and just go away and do your gigs and somehow kind of, you know, you know, just get into a pattern and 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 not explore all your own kind of potential, like so. So I remember I had known young Thomas Bartlett from when he was like uh, eleven. No, nine, I think, first. And uh, and I got to know him as a young child uh, when he was living up in Vermont. He actually put on a concert uh, as a 12-year-old uh, in Vermont that I, I, I played like. He was a very precocious kid and a very bright kid. And uh, but I I kind of stayed in contact with him over the years. But now he's later, he's he's living down in New York, and I'm up in Connecticut, and I'm like feeling kind of cut off and disconnected. And one day I just gave him a call. I says, hey, you know, I, I, I'm going to come down to the city. Let's let's go have coffee and hang out, you know, because now he's he's down there and he's playing with uh, Yoko Ono and David Byrne and he's playing with the National. He's playing. Well, I don't know if the National was playing at that stage, but he was out there in that kind of scene, like really connecting and really, you know, you know, doing things with Martha Wayne, right, and doing things with, you know, all kinds of people. And I thought, hey, I, I just need to hang out and 
kind of connect with this other world a little bit. And um, uh, like sometimes shortly after Irla, who Irla Linard, who many people in London will remember from Afro Health Sound System as well, uh, was you know he was floating around and wanting to do some work with Dennis and myself. And so there were a number of little threads kind of entering my head, and uh, and and it kind of led me to actually putting the beginning to shape up the idea of what was now the gloaming, you know, and um, uh, I, I, I wanted me to do something. And then I went and I says, you know, then Thomas and I did a small bit of recording in a studio when they just to find out what we could do. And then I thought, hey, he's good. We could do something, you know. And then I thought he and Dennis and Irla and myself, that'd be really good. Uh, and but I was I was feeling like something was missing in that mix and uh, and I'd been working with Padre Rida in from West Cork that would be the son of the late Sean Rida uh, on a project with Quivine O'Reilly and uh, Quivine is a very very interesting kind of creative musician and a fiddle player and and very different from me but very creative and wonderful and I thought hey he'd be a very good foil for me as well like you know so anyway, so I asked him then and he agreed to join. And so there you have it, the gloaming, you know. <laughs> and what what do you think it was, Martin, about that ensemble that created such an international buzz? Well, I, I, I mean, th there are a few things. Like, I mean, one was that it, it wasn't your typical traditional band and it didn't start out attempting to be that. Um, the other thing was that the band didn't have a set format for how it would forum and thirdly i think uh, all of the musicians in the band had a variety of kind of musical interests and influences that were allowed to freely walk their way in and out of the band just based on feeling and instinct and not not being pressurized to do so or not to do so so the idea was that the, the totality of one's musical uh, palette could be used freely whatever that meant. And uh, so in a sense, everybody was free to bring with them into the band, whatever influences were moving them. So, uh, and, and the tunes and the songs, of course, were central, but the interpretation became quite different. And we weren't sure what that sound would be. So the, the big part of it is simply allowing it to emerge, you know, and allowing it to, you know, show you what it is, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, you've done, uh, you know, you've done other things as well. Uh, during that time, you, you set up the Masters of Tradition down in, in Bantry. Um, you might talk about that for a little bit. You brought that, uh, I, I think you brought the Masters of Tradition. Did you bring that to Sydney as well? I did, yeah, to, to the Sydney Festival. Uh, I mean, I'd been out to Australia many times over the years, uh, but uh, the... What was the idea behind it? Well, it, it just happened out of a kind of a loose conversation. You know, I mean, I'm doing this Masters of Tradition Festival in Bantry every year. I've done it. And, and it's, it's a kind of a, a very much a traditional Irish music festival, but almost in a chamber setting and uh, almost, uh, you know, kind of like in, in a very intense kind of way, like it's being presented, but in a very refined kind of way also. So anyway, um, Fergus Linehan, who was running the uh, Sydney Festival at the time, uh, got word that, that I was doing this festival. And he goes, oh, I'd love to bring that festival to my festival uh, in Sydney. And I was going, I wonder how you do that. Uh, and he goes, yeah, just put a show together, kind of like put a kind of a synopsis of your festival together in a show format. So I said, oh, OK, I, I think I'll try and do that. You know, so I, like I just um, just put things together uh, as I was meeting people, you know, on the road. Like I was asking the musicians I was first meeting, would you do this, you know? Like it was very kind of casual and haphazard and, and they all agreed. So we, I, I later transpired that Fergus was saying, oh yes, we're going to do it in the Sydney Opera House. And I'm going, wow, okay, great. And that was seemed like a great, like what a lovely opportunity. We'll all go to the Sydney Opera House and do this. And, and then he goes, I'm, I'm going to put it on for two nights. And I'm going, oh, you are out of your mind. Uh, like, I mean, what? Like, you know, I couldn't imagine like that, like there would be that many people and that there would be enough interest. 
But sure enough, you know, whatever way he promoted it, however he organized it, like it was two sold out nights at the Sydney Opera House. And like, I think for me, you know, after years of, you know, struggling one way or another and, you know, and, and having all kinds of ideas about traditional music, it was, it was a very significant moment in my career, you know, like actually saying, okay, we kind of pulled something off here, you know, uh, walking onto that stage and having that experience was a, uh, quite a moment and I suppose in a way a, a very confidence building kind of a moment you know and it was all right around that period there when when when, when the gloaming is coming into existence when um you know there's there, you know it's all the the gloaming short actually happened shortly after that I suppose you know but you know it's it's um yeah I mean like what I found I suppose is you you have to be willing to take chances and you can't really spend too long in the comfort zone, you know, uh, or because it starts to kind of like, even if you don't notice it, it begins to burn itself out, you know. So you have to um, kind of, you know, just uh, jump in, take the chances. And uh, even if you don't know the outcome, you know, and you just have to like go with it. And, and so I, 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 that started to become a part of, who I was and how I do things. So I, I became a kind of a, an ongoing risk taker musically, you know, and just kind of a, like jumping in to do things that I didn't know how to do and say, somehow I'll figure it out, you know? And that figuring out is in fact, what I was supposed to regard as the growth process, you know, like, because, you know, there's nothing like having a concert or a deadline or anything else like that, that's sitting in front of you nothing focuses the mind quite like that, you know, like again, you know, public ridicule and humiliation is the other option. So you, you got to get it together, you know? <laughs> well, you mentioned the opera house there as being one, a, a great experience in feeling vindicated. Um, I was wondering if there were any other particular highlights uh, in your career that you'd look back on with pride. Oh yeah. I mean, like I'm a bit of a political junkie, like as that's kind of in the book there a little bit, but I, I mean, I suppose like, you know, like actually playing for, for Barack Obama and like ending up like feeling like I connected with him and, you know, and then having a, a, a nice conversation with him and stuff like that was a, a kind of a pinch me kind of moment, you know, I was going, okay, this is, you know, this is special, you know, and I think maybe even like the Kalura event at, 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 at Royal Albert Hall was another like particularly powerful moment uh, to be playing, you know, to be playing to a full, you know, Albert Hall on that kind of very memorable night, you know, of, a, of, of the first Irish state visit to the UK, you know, so that was like also kind of a very special moment. And there are lots of it, like, you know, and there are, and then the, you, my life is peppered with these other moments of kind of like musical ecstasy, you know, like where, 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 where you just have moments of musical breakthrough. And that can be anywhere. That can be in front of 50 people or it can be in front of 5,000 people. Uh, the, you know, the moment when you see unbounded kind of musical possibility in front of you and when you kind of cross into that potential that, you know, might have been eluding you for a while and suddenly the world frees up in front of you, you know, those are great musical moments, you know, and uh, they happen, you know, spattered here. I even remember nights uh, at the Irish Hammersmith uh, uh, playing, having fantastic occasions there, like, you know, and just really, really loving the atmosphere, you know, and, uh, and finding... we hope we'll see you there sometime again, too. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah. No, I know. I've, I, I've really enjoyed the, the playing at the centre, you know, it's, it's, it's great. And I mean, I, I used to avoid Irish centres, like, I mean, for years thinking like, oh, God, I don't want to get mixed up in this, like, this would be some kind of corny something or other, you know, just, this is, you know, this is not what I'm about, you know, but, but I found like, you know, and I don't want to sound patronising, and I'm not being, you know, but the Irish centre in Hammersmith, like, was different. Uh, it was open and it was, uh, I found the Irish Arts Centre in New York to be similar, you know, like, the, so there have been a few great advancements, uh, you, you know, in, in that thing culturally for the Irish in cities like London and New York, where, where it's much more open, much more progressive, much more willing to, to take a chance and much more, you know, optimistic, you know, and 
about the music and, and what possibilities and not, not playing into stereotypes and not simply, you know, replaying the past over and over, you know. The, um, the, the sessions at the Irish Centre are, are, I think, some of our most popular events. I was just going to ask you there about uh, passing on the mantle now that, uh, you know, you do um, master classes yourself and, and looking at the younger generation as you were passed on the mantle yourself from from your father and his friends. Um, how do you see the position now of Irish music? Is, uh, do you feel that the interest is there, that uh, the younger generation are as as earnest and as conscientious and as, as um, interested as as you were? Oh, I, I do, yeah. And not alone that, they're, they're interested and empowered and uh, in a way that I probably wasn't at the time, you know. Uh, so, like, for example, like in Ireland, like lots of third level education institutions are open now. People uh, investigate this music artistically and intellectually in ways that uh, my generation didn't have access to. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to go on that journey, you have to go on it personally, you know, in a way. But now there are, there's a lot of openness to that and people speak about the music. Uh, young musicians now talk about it in, in much more creative way in a way with where they talk about musically collaborative and creative potential you know in ways that we didn't uh, it wasn't the common you know language that with which we discussed this music so that has changed a lot and I, I I'm encountering a lot of uh, very sincere younger musicians and uh, people like who are very thoughtful and deep thinking about it. And so I, I feel like it's it's in good shape that way. You know? mm. And what about at local level then, Martin, in places like Clare? Are there people who keep the traditions alive, you know, the kind of unsung heroes? Oh, yeah. I mean, like Mary McNamara, who I, I mentioned earlier in the book, uh, like who was a, a concertina player that I had worked with for years. Like there are hundreds of young musicians in East Clare now. Uh, who like not alone do they play the music and play it well, but they have a, a very deep understanding of the local repertoire of the local musicians uh, that you know were the forerunners of this musical style of, of that locality. That they all have that and they all understand it and they all can play it. So like you know the, there's a, the musical culture of of of, of East Clare is 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 vastly different from how it was when I was growing up, and I think that's in no small measure uh, that's due to Mary McNamara, I think you know, and uh, and you know, a number of other musicians too. But Mary has been a kind of a leading teacher in that area, so I think like East Clare music is in better shape than it ever was, you know. All right, and I suppose you know there are people again, you know, in in. America and London as well doing the same thing I suppose in teaching uh, youngsters how to play and uh, you know keeping those uh, keeping those traditions alive. Yeah. Well the late Brendan Mulcair you know from Clare was like a huge figure uh, in London and, uh, and an enormously important musical figure um, uh, who's like you know like left a, a huge legacy musically in, in, in the UK uh, in terms of musicians of my age and younger who who he brought into the music and not just he didn't just bring them into play like he made sure that they really understood what this whole thing was about and and that they got a sense of the kind of ethos and, and social makeup of, of this music as well and its background you know mm. and what about yourself now obviously the lockdowns would have curtailed touring etc uh what are your current plans or your future plans for getting back on the road or uh, with different ensembles? Well, it's kind of gradually uh, taking shape, you know, that like, you know, I, I was in New York just a couple of weeks ago and um, to do a few gigs and uh, I'll be going back there in February and um, in March, I potentially have a few concerts in Dublin at the concert hall and um, in, in, April again, I have another US tour. Uh, so, you know, that's, um, so it's coming back bit by bit. But of course, you know, we, we understand the way this pandemic is going. It's quite unpredictable, but, um, but we're moving in the right direction. And yes, like live performance is, is like an irreplaceable part, you know, it's, it's like, a, and it's, it's certainly a, an irreplaceable part for me, you know, it's, it's, a, but I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to it. And, 
you know. And we're looking forward to seeing you too. And I think our time is nearly up, Martin. But uh, I just wanted to um, to say that it's a, it's, it's a great read. I really enjoyed reading it. But it's also it's very inspirational for anybody, I suppose, who, who uh, maybe is uh, stuck at a time in their life where they're not sure what, which way they're moving, that you can take inspiration from the fact that... Um, you know there are hard times but <clears throat> if you're a creative person and you follow your your heart that you you know you will get there um there was uh, a line there that i thought was uh, very uh, evocative of your um your your philosophy i suppose or you know where you say um all the experiences of nature the farm the landscape the folklore my imagination and the memories of great moments of music have become entwined in tunes. The deeper from within the tune comes, the more powerful it is. And would you say that kind of sums up your philosophy of music? Oh, yeah, I, I do think I feel like the music is um, like uh, above anything. It is a feeling, you know, it is it is the, like a, a form of the, for the expression of feeling. And uh, and so like the, the content of your musical reality is the content of your own, you know, emotional feeling reality, you know, so yeah. And on that note, Martin, would, would you mind very much playing us out with something, just something short to, okay. to say goodbye and uh, thank you very much. I would, of course. And listen, Anne, thanks for having me and thanks to everybody there at the Irish Centre in Hammersmith. And I hope to see you sometime down the road again. Here we go. Thanks a million, Martin. Yeah, I forgot to ask you for the, the title of the tune. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't know until I put the fiddle under my chin, but it's actually called Galway Bay. Galway Bay. Oh, well, since my it's father was from Galway, Galway, that's a very nice touch. It's a, it's a, it's a different Galway Bay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a million. 